So st it's Steve Ross uh, probably had a bigger impact on my life than anybody who I'm not related to. So it was uh, quite a task uh, to sit down and read uh, all these papers 30 or 40 years later and try to think about them in the context of what we know now and uh, about what we knew, uh, knew back then. So do I, sh I have to change these slides or are you changing them? I have, to, I have changed them, okay, hold on. My slide. So most of what I know, or a good fraction of what I know about corporate finance, I actually learned from Steve. So uh, even though Steve is sort of particularly known for his asset pricing and things like that, uh, we'll see that basically Steve didn't point out that there was any big difference between asset pricing and corporate finance. Um, Steve's responsible for me finishing graduate school. Uh, he actually tricked me into writing my dissertation. I'll talk about that in, in, in a little bit. Um, and I always somehow think of Steve as a very young man, and he st always had a very young mind. So this is a picture from just over a decade ago when he won the Chicago Mercantile Exchange Prize. Uh, and he still looked younger than most of the people in this room. Uh, so uh, I'm, 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 uh, I'll, I'll start with that. Uh, so, so, Steve, so Steve Ross um, basically, as I said, made no big distinction between corporate finance uh, and asset pricing. Um, I mean, it was only once I got to Chicago that I realized that this was thought of as two different fields. Uh, so he, Steve's style was incredibly neoclassical. So even though you know, the Yale Economics Department and the University of Chicago were very different, say, in their macroeconomic spheres, uh, so I sort of felt right at home at Chicago when I got there uh, because, I mean, Steve is as neoclassical essentially as they come. And I learned essentially when I got there that Merton Miller put him toward the very, very top of all financial economists. So, I mean, so did I, of course, but I mean, Merton and I got the feeling that from Steve actually put Merton Miller toward the very top of all financial economists. So there was a, there was a definite similarity in style uh, and in... Uh, in trying to make sure things that were very applied. So Steve, as you all know, Steve was incredibly mathematically gifted, but he only used mathematics essentially to make sure that he was right on things. So he was very much into uh, ideas and applications. Uh, Lean had mentioned this uh, at the beginning, uh, that a lot of his work is sort of was derived from problems in the world both not just academic problems, but problems that people in uh, practitioner finance faced. Uh, so he was super creative, and he saw things uh, that, that most other people um, did not. So he typically, as, as an advisor, if you would go in and talk to him, he would understand what you were doing, at least what I was doing, well before I did and usually sort of just say a word or two to sort of push you in the direction of, of where, the, where the ultimate answer was. Um, he didn't usually tell you the answer, but it was clear that he knew what it was. Uh, so that actually is a, you know, a very uh, useful you know, talent. Uh, you know, I tried my best to, impl to copy that as, as, an, as an advisor, but I mean, you have to actually see all those things to do it. So it's not, it's not that easy a thing. We didn't mention this as well. It's a, it's a very hard uh, task to copy, but it, it, uh, it, was, uh, it, it was very important to, uh, to his colleagues, to his students. Uh, okay. So I mentioned that Steve didn't draw a big distinction between what was corporate finance and what was asset pricing. So I actually went back through my memory. I was trying to say, well, what did Steve say about finance? And I may have this like only 90% right, but I'm virtually certain that the first day of the first class that I took from Steve, he defined what finance was. And he said, finance is the field in economics where you make strong assumptions to get strong results. I said, oh, okay, I thought it had something to do with like capital allocation and things like that. So no, it's, a, it's, a, it's methodologically, this field as, as it stood uh, in the 1970s, essentially was this very, very applied field where the gap between empirical work and um, theory was quite small. So that essentially the, the, you know, the great data that we were getting uh, was forcing theories in a particular direction and it was actually forcing people doing theory 
to make sure that the, the, the implications could be, could be brought uh, to the data. So again, there's no discussion here about you know, corporate finance, asset pricing, supply versus demand. Uh, and you know, I sort of took this to heart. In fact, when I talked to our incoming PhD students at Chicago, I sort of asked them, okay, who's only interested in asset pricing? And you know, half the people raised their hand. Who's only interested in corporate finance? Like 10% of the people raised their hand. And, and I said, okay, that's the wrong answer. You know, like there's not like the field of labor demand and the field of labor supply. It's all about the interaction. So it's about the intersection, not the anti-interaction, I guess. Uh, so Steve's, you know, was even a little stronger than that. So this is, this is an applied field. And as, as many people have said, I mean, finance has been one of the most successful fields. Financial economics has been one of the most successful fields uh, in you know, the last 30 years, 40 years or so. No small part due to Steve Ross, but in no small part to, to this view of what, uh, of, of what this field is. Um, so when I originally got the request to be on this panel, I thought I was going to get to talk for half an hour uh, about what a wonderful person Steve is. Uh, so I got the, instead, I got to talk about that a little bit and also talk about his, his work in corporate finance. So he was one of the least selfish people in, in our profession. It's, and you know, finance, I think, is a reasonably uh, unselfish, it's not like a push your own agenda subfield. But Steve would basically help anyone in a seminar, uh, you know, not necessarily by saying they were right, sometimes by saying they were wrong. But he was always polite, he was always creative, and he would always try to push you to do something better. Uh, so I get he understood what other people were doing before they did. And going back and reading his papers, uh, some of them um, sort of on the first paper ever written on a certain topic, uh, he, this side of Steve that wanted to help other people was, was really uh, surprisingly there, and I hadn't noticed it the first time I read these. He would say, well, I'm gonna make this assumption. I said, this is a crazy assumption, but we have to make it to make some progress, and if you really thought about it, the better assumption would be this, but that's too hard right now. So his early papers, which some of which I'll survey in, in, in just a minute, essentially gave the reader you know, an introduction to what the, what the literature was ultimately going to look like. And Steve sort of set it up so at the very beginning of the literature, you could, make, you could at least see what the framework was, see under some str very strong assumptions to get strong results, again, Steve's methodology. You could get something that you could then build on. Uh, so, uh, so I visited here at the Sloan School in 2015, and I was very sad that uh, Steve was, was on sabbatical that year. Uh, I actually did see him uh, at an NBER conference toward the end of the year. I'll talk about that at, at the very end. But uh, I was lucky to have Steve as an advisor, and then I worked for a year as his colleague at Yale, and he wasn't actually that different as a colleague than he was as an advisor. He was still you know, giving, uh, giving good advice and telling me when I was doing stupid things. Uh, so, Steve was just, I mean, as I mentioned, apart from people I'm related to, there's no one who's had a bigger, bigger impact on my life. Uh, so he, Steve was very mathematically gifted, but down deep he was an idea person. He was an idea man. Uh, he gave us new ways to look at problems, and essentially his agency papers were, you know, the, the, we'll talk about those in a second, were sort of coming out with some, a problem that, that people hadn't basically posed before. And he did a bunch of extensions on those, but the key thing, you read those papers, it sort of says, well, fix this, fix this, fix this. And uh, you know, the number of very, very famous people extended those things. And we'll talk about the uh, incentive signaling approach to thinking about uh, capital structure. That was a lot, we'll talk about that one as, as, as well. Uh, that was, you know, tied with one other paper co-authored by Hane Leland, we'll talk about, that uh, as the, the first uh, idea of bringing what these ideas of spent signaling uh, had to say about uh, capital structure. Uh, and those were sort of, he, that paper has hundreds of things in it, from hundreds, maybe a little, many things in it, that eventually became important parts of the literature uh, and things that we could think about uh, as problems with, with, with what he did, okay? 
So then the other, like, there's so many things that Steve did, I was trying to organize them around some theme. He also had these sort of very useful tools to go beyond sort of the, the general wisdom on, on how you do stuff. So going beyond simple Arrow Pratt measures of risk aversion, I'll talk about a few things that are uh, in that space. Um, and I'll only talk about papers today that are solely offered by, by Steve. It just turns out that way. Okay, so let's start with this thing on incentive signaling. So that's, the, you know, this is a, a, a paper that's essentially on all corporate finance PhD lists. So, you know, probably most of you have, have, have read it carefully. Uh, I hadn't read it uh, probably since uh, 1980 or something like that. Uh, so, as I said, this is the first model of thinking about uh, financial structure as revealing information uh, to the market through a, through a signaling uh, approach quite like uh, Michael Spence's. And along with Hain Leland and David Pyle, uh, you know, it, these two papers or independent that came up um, very, in, very differently. Uh, the Leland and Pyle's idea, which is, you know, quite an important idea, is that essentially the signal was limited amount of risk sharing. So if an, I'm an entrepreneurial firm going public, uh, if I want to sell the whole thing, that probably doesn't look too good, but if I'm willing to keep, you know, um, you know 10 generations of, of consumption volatility on my own personal uh, account, that probably tells you I think that the, the average, the mean of this thing is pretty high. So that's one way. That's really more about risk sharing. Uh, you can get uh, capital structure into it as a backdoor via risk sharing, but Steve's paper was very much about basically leverage. The idea was that you promise a certain amount of money to pay outsiders, think of that as like the face value of a debt contract, and if you're the manager, bad things happen to you if you, if you don't deliver that amount. Okay, so you can sort of, so debt is really essential to Steve's theory. So Steve actually has no risk sharing at all, he has people being risk neutral. Uh, so it's like, you know, essentially very complementary to, to the to Leland Pyle approach. Uh, so Leland and Pyle was about this unlimited liability debt, uh, so it's a, just straight risk sharing. His was about default, and I mean both things are, I mean both risk sharing and the effects of default are obviously very important to thinking about what it means when a, a manager uh, chooses a, a certain, uh, certain capital structure, but I think it was sort of a, a little different than what people were thinking. The idea is that managers hate default, right? That's sort of like the opposite of this risk shifting idea. You know, the risk shifting idea is that managers get zero over a little default, a big default, et cetera. The idea that really bad stuff happens to managers when they default is turning a lot of the, of the, of the subsequent agency stuff on its head. Uh, and I'll talk about something other of Steve's in the risk sharing space that, that also uh, could, could make in a point like that. So, Basically, there are a series of follow-up papers on the principle of similarity, on the idea that you may want to relate the, the, the risk tolerance of agents and principles to be somewhat like each other's. Uh, he points out in this literature tons of open, uh, open uh, uh, questions, but he doesn't actually, uh, you know, obviously solve them all in the very first, the first thing. So one thing he points out that has become a big uh, deal in the, the, the recent literature uh, is that it's not so obvious why you, if you're going to signal, if something's bad going to happen to the manager when cash flows are low, it's not so obvious why that has to have anything to do with its, its capital structure. You could just fire the manager or, you know, uh, take her house away if, you know, cash flows were below a certain level. So he points that out that that's, it's an open question why we have to think about this as, as related to capital structure. It could be related um, to all kinds of other things. So, uh, you know, that was an idea sort of floating around. The cleanest paper on that uh, is actually a paper of, of Phil Diviggs and Jamie Zenders that basically says you can just, you, you want Medigliani Miller, you want to have capital structure not matter, first write the best contract you want for more or less anything. It doesn't have to be signaling, it could be incentives. And if everything is like observable and stuff like that, you can do it. And then now what's left is just cash flow and uh, apart from taxes, you have, uh, you have Medigliani and Miller. So this, this set of, uh, there, sort of the number of ideas in this, this very first paper uh, that, 
got people thinking about you know, things much more generally was, was, was in, in incredibly big. So the, Steve had lots of insights, and the fact that he would point out uh, all of the potential problems you would see with this approach, essentially say, Steve was into education and not marketing. Uh, so this is, you could have written that paper in a very different way to, to, to sweep a lot of the, uh, of the issues under the rug. Okay, so next set of, of Steve's papers I want to talk about is this thing on agency. Uh, so, you know, the principal and agent problem. So, so this is published in 1973, it was like a 1971 or 72 paper. So this, just, you know, since some of you were too young to remember this, this is like before Jensen and Meckling, before Holmstrom, Harris, Revive, et cetera. So basically this wasn't, this was like a issue, this is a problem that really had not been posed. It wasn't just sitting there for people to, to actually, actually solve it. And there's basically, he points out, the agency problem is a trade-off between risk sharing and incentives. And he looks at the nature of delegated decision making, the role of Pareto efficiency, uh, and the similarity of preferences uh, between agents and principals. And the only paper that was sort of previous to this that was thinking about this problem was Robert Wilson's theory of syndicates. And, uh, you know, that was sort of, you know, and Steve acknowledges that quite a bit. And Steve has a lot about the linearity of the fee schedule, which sort of does a very nice generalization uh, of what Bob Wilson did. Okay, so this, this set off, I mean, you know, ag agency is probably, a, you know, a, a third of what corporate finance turned into. Uh, so Steve was sort of there, it was Steve's idea, and it was Steve, this paper again has, this is sort of a crazy assumption here, but you know, you can fix it, and, the, and the, all kinds of assumptions. So he was like the first person to set this up as, you know, the, the first order uh, approach. There, there's a first order condition of the, of the agent's problem, which is a constraint uh, on the principal's problem. You know, he realized that there were some, some issues with that, and people later, like, um, figured out how to, how to get around that. So, but, so Steve basically had the great insight here and, uh, and you know, set us all, uh, on, on, not me, set all, all, all of us on this, on this problem. So then I mentioned that the, the last thing I was gonna talk about was Steve's thinking a lot about uh, risk aversion going beyond just Aero Pratt. So essentially, so this is a Conometrica paper, and then there's this paper, Compensation Incentives and the Duality of Risk Aversion and Riskiness. So, you know, so uh, Steve basically thought a lot about how risk averse one would be compared to something where you're not just starting with a certain, you, you know, you don't start under certainty and then you add a risk to that. Like for people in the world, you start with some uncertainty, your human capital, you know, what, what what you're going to do for a living when you grow up, uh, whether you're going to be, you know, uh, you know, long horizon or short horizon optimizer, things like that. So we have all of this uncertainty. So Steve's Conometrica paper showed some very nice ways to think about when you're uh, when you're retaining uh, when you're retain when you have a certain amount of risk and you add another set of risks to it. What goes on? So a lot of this stuff on like entrepreneurship and the and risk taking by uh, individuals who are not managers of big uh, uh, publicly traded companies use this. Uh, I thought about proper risk aversion. Uh, he used this to think about uh, Paul Samuelson's fallacy of large numbers. I was able to use it to think about diversification in banks. Uh, so, you know, this was, this was a, a tool that, uh, was, that basically was, was, was not out there before, before Steve uh, started this stuff. Uh, people had thought about these issues, but Steve, like, again, figured out a very nice, simple but general characterization of how to think about this stuff. So then the second paper here, uh, Compensation Incentives and the Duality of Risk Aversion and Riskiness, basically takes this idea and takes seriously the idea that you may not be equally risk averse over all different parts of your consumption stream and makes the point that just giving somebody option compensation or something, given a convex payoff function or a concave payoff function, doesn't necessarily move the, uh, the, the risk tolerance of the agent, gambling incentives, say, from, from giving people options, doesn't necessarily move the, 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 the risk tolerance of the agent in the same direction that a risk neutral agent would move. So, 
You know, so it's not the case that if you see highly levered um, uh, firms, that, that managers would be, you know, doing crazy things to gamble. Uh, this goes back to the ideas that I mentioned before, that Steve has the, had this other idea that bad stuff happens to managers when they go bankrupt or default on their, on their debt. So that's a sort of a type of, you know, of the opposite of, of risk tolerance. That's a type of induced risk aversion. Uh, so Anad is going to talk about this, this idea, but I'm just trying to relate this back to the idea that S Steve took risk sharing and thinking about what risk aversion really was very seriously. And it wasn't, again, it wasn't just some little technical thing uh, that, that, that people wanted to worry about. It was something that actually had a big impact uh, on, on his view of the world. So in people in empirical corporate finance end up using Tobin's Q as a measure of intangibles or of like monopoly power uh, in, in an industry. So what's Tobin's Q? It's the, it's the ra ratio of the market value of a firm to the replacement cost of its capital. So Jim Tobin used that as an indicator of when uh, firms ought to be investing in neoclassical or in a somewhat neoclassical world. Uh, so before Tobin, it was the idea that, well, interest rates go down, there should be more investment, interest rates go up, there should be less investment. But that's just sort of one, that's like the discount rate. So it's a question of how are, is the market telling you you want more capital in this or, or less capital in this particular firm? So this par paper with, with Eric Lindenberg basically says, well, that, that's true. That is a very nice application of this. But if you think about why the market value of a firm might be different from the replacement cost of its capital, that tells you something about some kind of rents or some kind of quasi-rents going on in the firm. Uh, and essentially, that, I mean, there's probably, I don't know, a good fraction, 15% of the, uh, the you know, like empirical corporate finance papers that are related to things like governance that are used something like Tobin's Q as the measure, and th the license to do that uh, came from, from, from this paper. Okay, so here's one you pr may not have read. I had not read it. Phil Divig pointed it out to me when I was talking to him to make sure I hadn't forgotten 20 of, of, of Steve's papers, and, and Phil knew them all. So, uh, so this is a paper that was originally published in 19, originally written in 1990, but published in the Journal of Applied Finance in 2005, Capital Structure and the Cost of Capital. And if you're ever looking for a paper on teaching this stuff, uh, uh, with, you know, it's dynamic contracting including taxes and bankruptcy costs, I mean, this, this was, a, you know, an amazingly good paper. And, uh, there are many insights, uh, including equity holders do not benefit necessarily from, from higher volatility. At certain times, they might want to be the opposite of high volatility, they want low volatility. And there's some, in, interestingly, in terms of uh, you know, the, the history of the, the Foundation for Advancement of Research in Financial Economics, there's some overlap between this paper and Hay Leland's paper that won the, 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 the very first Steve Ross Prize. Uh, but there are actually some significant differences between the two papers. So if you're a fan of, of Haynes' paper, which obviously most people would be, you should be a fan of this one. And it's sort of sitting in the Journal of Applied Finance where a lot of us don't look. But I mean, this, this actually probably spend more time reading this paper than these others because I'd, I'd never read this one before. And uh, it, it dealt with a lot of issues that I've, I've been personally very interested in. Okay, so Steve Ross's mind was always young. So I mentioned I always think of Steve as this young man, uh, and basically he didn't give like great man talks that talk about, you know, you young people should work on this. So he was always happy to be controversial and creative. So the, the final time I heard him speak in an academic setting was a few blocks from here at a National Bureau of Economic Research conference on long run uh, risk taking and asset management or something like that. And he gave a, uh, you know, a, a, a talk at that conference, and he presented a very persuasive argument that uh, sovereign wealth funds should get in the business of cr writing, creating, and uh, um, encouraging the markets of very long-run put and call options. Essentially, there's sort of all of the action in, in, in derivatives is in really short-term stuff. And you know, part of that is that people maybe don't really want to hedge long-term stuff, but he thought more, more importantly is nobody really wanted to take those risks. And then he gave a persuasive argument that 
probably if somebody doesn't want to take all these risks, there might be a nice return in taking these risks, and no one better than, than, than sovereign wealth funds. So people start getting all excited. There are people from sovereign wealth funds in the, in the room. So Steve knew this would be a controversial idea, which I think got people thinking, and there was, I mean, most of the discussion thereafter was, was, was about this idea. Uh, so that's just an example of the kind of creativity Steve has always had. Uh, it's the kind of thing that, you know, someone who's, he did it very politely, but he, he, he caused a lot of, of anxiety and thinking about, for people in this thing. Uh, so just the final example that Steve Ross was a, was a, a first-class person with, with a first-class mind. Uh, thank you very much. I use the same format. Um, I think our talks are going to be very complementary uh, to uh, one another. We didn't see each other's uh, slides. We're going to—I'm going to try to give you my take on some mostly different papers and some other parts about uh, Steve. Um, I was a student of Steve from Yale uh, shortly after. Doug, and there were a bunch of us at the time at Yale. Uh, a few of us are in this room, and including uh, all of my advisors, except for Steve, who was John Genicopoulos and Phil Divig. Um, anyway, um, in the next 30 minutes, what I want to do, I was told recently not to use a lot of bullets, so you're going to see some other formats that are not in bullet form. Uh, I'm going to try to make a few observations about why we celebrate and why we cherish and why we so much miss Steve. I'm going to talk about some corporate finance papers. I'm going to say what, I, what that means. Doug was already alluding to the definitional issue and the division of these fields in our group. I'm going to talk about why he was so great at research. I'm going to talk about his teaching and mentoring a little bit. And I'm going to talk about his greatness past resume, uh, things you can't quite see when you look. Now, Steve's research contribution is very broad. We were asked to talk about corporate finance, and I interpreted corporate finance, and I think Doug the same, as sort of not asset pricing, so everything else. So he talked about risk aversion. I'm going to talk uh, about a, a few things that, you know, corporations will be there, but it's not necessarily always corporate finance necessarily. Certainly not that first agency problem had nothing to do with finance. Steve was not in finance at the time. So I'm going to start with that, actually. What I would focus on is the notion of frictions from differences in incentives, differences in preferences, and differences in information. And uh, that is certainly something that uh, I've spent uh, my career on. And Steve was very uh, aware of that. And that sort of agency and information is hidden information, hidden action is really where, where this would be. And the focus would be on where contracts matter, where institutions matter. So that's the um, context, and I'm going to show you how Steve, even though this is not what's considered the main uh, contribution, and Doug and I got an hour, whereas asset pricing got an hour and a half, and three people, uh, is uh, he, there was a lot, a lot there uh, for, for those of us who, who are interested in asset pricing in, in corporate finance. And I, of course, started doing what you might consider more as asset pricing. I don't know where performance measurement fits in or hedge fund watermarks or any of the other stuff where you classify those kinds of things. But anyway, uh, but that's really where I would focus on in Steve's work uh, over, over the years, from the beginning to what some of the end was, although that's not as much the visible end. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So this paper Doug touched on, and I want to say some other things about it. Yes, it was one of Steve's first papers. He was still at Penn. Uh, it, he describes the background for this as going back to trying to. The mic? Sorry. As, oh, sorry. As the, the uh, coming out of a situation where he was selling a car in Boston, and there was uh, basically a, a young buyer and her uh, boyfriend, who was a little older, was eligible to kind of buy it without having the option to return it in six months was going to be her agent. And uh, in talking to a lawyer, he heard the terms principal and agents, which I did a search on uh, 
on, on that, the term principal agent because it wasn't even used in Wilson, uh, whether Steve was the first to use it. It was used in the insurance uh, literature before that. Uh, but in the sort of mainstream of economics, the, the words principal and agents were not as used in the early 80s, in the early 70s. This was the time of signaling and Akerlof and, and, and Wilson and all of that. Anyway, that was his inspiration. And he got the terms from, uh, from a lawyer and thought that was a very neat way to think about it. And then he thought, oh, that applies to everything, everything. And so then he wrote this little very short uh, piece. Uh, so there was a general formulation, as Doug said, of the agency problem. There was a search for optimal um, contracts and Pareto optimal contract and what's the principal problem subject to what the agent maximizing and all of that. This received very cool reception from his colleagues at, uh, at Penn at the time, okay? And I'm going to show you a little clip where Steve talks about that. Uh-oh. I really need that clip uh, to play. What the fi my file, which I have on, is linked to a video, and I really need that video because I have another one. Is there a play thing right there? What? Is there a There's a play thing. Go to the slide. Oh, and click on play. Into it's embedded into the slides. Slide. Yeah. There is another slide. Oh, here it is. Volume, I need. Mean. What? Can we start again? said that I'd surprised them, not because of this, and shown some promise as a theorist. <laughs> I thought that was a yeah. backhanded compliment. But the zinger was that I would be... Back in my slide? Okay. And then... A young but senior faculty member, I'll tell you if you really beard me, right. who's now a friend, took me aside and said that I'd surprised them, not because of this, and shown some promise as a theorist. <laughs> I thought that was a backhanded compliment, but the zinger was that I would be better served if I worked on some serious topics in economics and not in this agency stuff. <laughs> I, I, I got that advice, and I was very discouraged by it, and so I stopped thinking about agency theory. So I just didn't do anything after that, you know? So don't, don't tell people these things. These are terrible things to tell people. Okay, going to come back. So he heeded that advice. He then, as he describes it, went to finance at Wharton and discovered Fisher Black and Cap M and finance and John Cox, and he was hooked on finance. So that was the transition in the mid-'70s from, uh, from being in trade theory in the PhD program to agency, discovering agency, to being shut from doing agency and then discovering option pricing and, and APT, writing APT and all that. But he did do the signaling paper, which was not agency quite. Uh, that paper uh, had an incentive contract kind of hidden in there, but it wasn't about agency. It was a signaling model as Doug described. And so, uh, so that, that, that was that. So it wasn't an agency problem in 77 as he was doing APT and all this other stuff that would come up later. But he did go back. So by 88, 89, he was, 88 was the a a AFA, he was a big boy. And he was at Yale, uh, and it was actually past my time, and he went back to agency big time. This was a presidential address, and I, Douglas said he reread a paper. I was working on market microstructure, you know, crash of 87, that was exactly 30 years ago yesterday. and. Um, and wasn't paying attention to Steve's uh, presidential address, but this is a paper I just read a lot in the last few weeks. And I want to quote a bit, I want to focus more on this paper, and I'm going to end with this paper. This is the abstract, and I just want you to see how many times he's actually referring to agency and agency. And then the bottom line of the abstract is, in short, institutions matter. This is not the kind of thing you associate with Steve usually saying that, those kinds of things. This is what he said in his presidential address. And this was a picture that was, came with it. This is a picture that came with it. I mean, is that Steve? Um, so uh, so that, that's, I'm going to show you that just the last bit. The innovations so he was writing about financial innovations, which were just starting. This is the 80s. This is not CDO squares and all this stuff that came later. Uh, 
This was stripping bonds or something he was talking about. Th those are kind of innovations that he was describing then. Uh, the innovations can be thought of as solving moral hazard problem. An agency theoretic example serves to uh, illustrate the demand supply and financial marketing of stripped securities in short institutions matters. So this is about marketing. I don't think we have a lot of the word in, the, in finance, marketing. What's marketing got to do with finance? Well, this was in the title of Steve's presidential address. And, uh, and I'm gonna give you a few quotes from that incredible presidential address that has a lot of things in it. Okay, some gems from that. I had to really spend, even last night, and thank you to Paul for paring down the 10, 15 slides you were gonna bear here, and down to three. Uh, okay, our financial markets have become uh, institutional markets in that institutions are often the most significant traders and holders of active positions. This has only gotten more so. In other words, in our models there are agents and we aggregate and he noticed that there are actually institutions in between that there are intermediaries in between. And what's that about? And in particular, we had models about, about commercial banking, but we didn't have models about investment banking. What are they doing? So Steve was asking those kinds of questions. What about security design? In fact, what the other thing he was talking about was the fact that here we use uh, you know, replication and to, to, to price, but isn't that awkward and embarrassing that we justify why we need more options uh, because we need to complete markets, but then we say that they're derivatives. So what's wrong with that? What kind of frictions is it solving? You know, creating leverage, avoiding taxes, whatever. So he was saying, why are we innovate? Because of some frictions, okay? That was it. Oh, and then he talked about institutions and he said, OPEC institutions are those in which monitoring, bonding, and control costs, agency problems, are most severe. For example, a depositor in SNL has almost no knowledge of the particular loans the institution is making. So banks are very opaque, and that makes it difficult for them to have a contract, like depositors don't have contracts. When we take account of the contractual relation under which opaque institutions operate, it seems heroic to think that they mirror individual solving portfolio problems the way we do it in asset pricing, usually. More gems, investment banks and law firms. So here's Steve down on the ground talking about the particulars of setting something up and all the costs associated with that. Investment banks and law firms specialize in activities and he, that was such as understanding the problem, validating the proposed interaction. He was going down to the, to the level of doing that. The selling price must cover the moral hazard costs arising from the inability to perfectly assess the assets as well as the adverse selection costs involved in any asset purchase. So he was saying that all of these are kind of ex ante costs in the end, the, all the frictions that are happening in those interactions that are filled with conflicts of interest and with asymmetric information. It is the institutional structure of contracts and incentives that permits innovations to continue, be it the Japanese tax rules. So he was saying people respond to taxes, people respond to, to regulations. Uh, for insurance companies, government regulations and SNLs, or the private placement lenders' insistence on loan priority. In other words, the, the, the fact that people, some people are not gonna get to make decisions, they need covenants, whatever else. Or they need collateral in the, in the paper that Doug was talking about, he emphasized collateral, uh, actually. Finally, in the conclusion, he says things like this, in, institutional markets and financial marketing are essential to understanding financial innovation and are almost entirely unexplored. On marketing, by the way, along the way, he said that marketers explain securities. There's a need to explain the securities, okay? It's striking then at the very last paragraph, he says how little modern finance currently has to say about such fascinating behavior, which he defined as, for example, why they compete creating different indices. What's that about? So he posed enormous number of really fascinating questions that he, from just observing uh, the world, that he claimed we didn't explore enough. Now this is not one of his highly cited papers. This was his presidential address. So one of the things I wanna do is encourage you to uh, look there, but I'm gonna have further comments on this paper later on uh, of my own because this is pretty old paper. So I'm gonna try to bring forward a broader set of questions that I think really relate to this paper. So what was Steve's greatness as researcher really, which is all seen in that presidential address, and I'm gonna just touch very briefly on other papers, he was a very alert observer of models and of reality, both. 
And he was a theorist primarily, but he was really connecting what he was seeing and he was finding the puzzle. So you can see that very much in that presidential address, what he, the way he was doing that. And then of course there was a little model there, which he, and he, when he talks about writing, he was talking about how the introduction was so important, the conclusion so important, and what you do in the middle is just showing that you didn't lie or something like that. You know, that it was just kind of the math stuff in the middle. But, but the, the thing I want to emphasize here, keen to understand, because you know Doug was saying that Steve was unselfish, but he he says he's very selfish in research. He did the research because he wanted to know. So there's very few people who are so anxious to just know the answer and why I didn't move all the way to business like most people do and stayed doing research till the very end because he really cared about it. He really loved it, really passionately, and he just wanted to understand. Just curious. Oh, sorry, I meant to step forward. He was a very, very clear thinker. He didn't, he didn't uh, deal well with sort of fuzzy thinking. And he was very enthusiastic about the research method. He came from Caltech. He wanted science. He wanted it to be a science. We're looking things. We're kind of building a theory. We're going back to test it, you know, that. He sort of thought of it like, like physics, you know, something like that, because he was a physics major. Uh, he was obviously incredibly skilled in all this stuff that you need to do, all the math he could do. He could see through, and he could develop intuition, and he could explain that intuition. So it wasn't just pushing symbols. He really understood uh, the, the intuition, and he wanted that intuition. And he often started with examples. So papers always often start with a simple example and then generalize uh, to that. So uh, this is back to today. We're talking about tax reform. I found this little gem in. Um, one of Steve's uh, hidden little tiny funny notes, which is in Journal of Economic Perspective, he, uh, there was a volume to 30 years to Mildigliani and Miller. And he uh, had some very playful thing. He and Mert Miller just absolutely loved each other. And there was a contribution from Merton there. And so he was talking about uh, Gödel and how you know we owe to Merton Miller, like math owes to Gödel, which had this this uh, this uh, paradox about how you can't always you know there's uh, there's always something that you can't prove. And he said, no, this is the, the theorem that he can't quite put a QED on. He said, but you know it's sort of about right. Uh, no finite and feasible system of business taxation can collect positive revenues. It's just so, you know, Mr. Arbitrage Man was very much knowing about regulatory arbitrage and tax arbitrage and all of these things. I mean, he knew how that worked. Uh, and so, uh, so that was kind of the theorem. It's like, oh, yeah, you can play with the taxes, but they'll, get, they'll always get around it, kind of the theorem. Uh, so just uh, this paper uh, I talked about, I just love this picture of Steve, uh, a little bit closer to, to, to the ages, you know, slightly grayer hair. But, uh, but, but this paper that, uh, that Doug talked about from perspective of risk aversion uh, is an agency paper. Okay, by now he's forgotten about the pen people. I mean, when he said he never did it again, that was wrong. I mean, he did do, uh, like the presidential address, like this. This is an agency paper about how, what, and it, but it's not, here is the point I want, to f I want to just quote from this. Agency theory has long intensively studied the functional relation between the optimal contract and the utility function of the agent. And after that, he cited himself, 73, Holmstrom, et cetera, optimal contracts, uh, et cetera. Unfortunately, the effort to characterize optimality, often in highly specific and parametric models, has crowded out the study of the behavior of the agent given the specific contract form of the sort that we are commonly observed in practice. So let's take option compensation and let's see whether it's true what we tell students that uh, options always make you uh, less risk averse. Because, as he says, the intuition that, uh, that uh, the value of option increases, uh, increases in volatility and therefore going to make you uh, like risk more, uh, you're already not in markets. You're already in a risk averse person and you're giving them an option um, that is extremely leveraged. So maybe they won't like it. And it depends what range, et cetera, et cetera. So he completely nails the problem. Because there were examples in the literature, but Steve Ross nailed it, 19, uh, 2004. OK. Teaching. So Steve was a great communicator, and obviously was a great mentor. And there's a lot of teachings that we do. OK, so I'm going to focus on teachings of corporate finance. Obviously, the teachings to academics, such as the research you do, and there's different levels of that. You can write little notes. You can, you can write uh, applied papers. And that's the same as writing to doctoral students, but there's also the teaching to doctoral students. He was one that was sort of defined finance at Yale. That's the, the years that I know about 
where this one course on Monday morning, 9 to 12, was kind of it. And people, uh, John Campbell is nodding, uh, people took that class and that was finance. There was n so basically not, not, not much else. I mean, John Ingersoll was there, et cetera. But this was the one course that you took. And then that was it. I was an operations research student. Some other people were from econ. And he was taking us from all over and converting us to, to finance. We wouldn't have, many of us would not have done finance if it wasn't for Steve. Uh, so, so there was just a huge amount about that that many people here can tell you about. Uh, that was a big part of what, uh, what Steve really liked to do. And, uh, and many of us are incredibly uh, bonded with him uh, and uh, attached to him and, and he to us, uh, I think, it was. Now, he did teach MBAs and college, and college students, mostly MBAs, because he was in a business school, but some of his textbooks are for undergrads. And then I want to talk a little bit about teaching to off-campus audiences uh, and Steve's involvement in that, mostly informal, uh, although a little bit his name is on it. So this is one book he wrote for Princeton. So that was a set of lectures uh, that, that he wrote. That's a kind of a doctoral level teaching. He did write uh, as a co-author um, for, or he's, he's co-authored four corporate finance textbooks that are at all the levels. Uh, so, so that's that. Now I want to transition actually to, uh, to the, the kind of other teaching. And I wanted to do that by quoting Steve uh, in a footnote on the paper on uh, incentive signaling, where he was uh, sort of lamenting this irrelevancy result that we're stuck with. Uh, and, and obviously, we all know that you know, the, really the result of Modigliani and Miller is about what does not what is not the right reason for why capital structure measure. It doesn't, it's not the reason because somebody bears more risk than others. That's not the reason. If it matters, it matters because of the total somehow changing with the capital structure because of frictions like taxes and, other, and others. So in the footnote, he says, most of the most sobering experience for a student of finance is to explain the irrelevancy proposition to a corporate treasurer. Uh, that's, that's, that's in a footnote. Okay, so that's still a corporate treasurer is somebody sort of professional uh, in, in the economy. So does it matter to teach beyond the people actually doing that? Well, if you go back to Steve's um, presidential address, he was talking about innovation and institutions and, and investment banking and all of that. Well, this is the system that has evolved uh, since. Uh, you know, it was already somewhat complicated, but this is just part of a poster that Tobias Adrian, and, who's also a student, uh, and, uh, and others have developed where they showed the really complicated system of lots and lots of, uh, of different institutions in between. In other words, very complicated system. Paul Fleider created this visual, uh, which sort of, there's a dollar sign inside each box to say, okay, if you create this system with lots and lots and lots of intermediaries in between, you know, there were enough moral hazard and agency problems by Steve Ross's teaching to kind of justify creating another institution, intermediating uh, in there. Well, well, what's all of that about exactly? Well, in 88, when Steve wrote his presidential address, you know, he was talking about a relatively simple setting with, you know, one investment bank in the middle, and then there were some institutional customers, there was, but there were lots of institutions here uh, in, in this picture. And the question is, what is that about? Now, this system actually collapsed and created a financial crisis. So this did happen about a decade ago, uh, nine years uh, uh, since, um, since Lehman collapsed, but it started really uh, before. And so what's that about? Well, and what is this about? So uh, this is K Street. K Street is the home of some sort of o over the line, you know, lobbying firm in Washington. And uh, but there's a lot of underground lobbying going on as well. So what's that about? Uh, and what does that have to do with Steve Ross's presidential address? Well, here is some perspective on that. In 2010, Steve joined uh, some of us writing a letter that was meant to be to uh, G20. Uh, finance leaders, except it got in the letter section, so then it was a letter to Sir. Uh, that's the way the letters in, in, journal, uh, in uh, Financial Times go. And we were protesting the f uh, regulation, regulatory reform of uh, capital requirements, which are about leverage, um, after the financial crisis. Banks' high leverage contributed to the near collapse of the financial system. 
uh, if at least 15%, and we debated the number, we could have said 20, whatever, Jean Tom was there, I'll show you the list. Uh, of the total, the social benefits will be substantial, the social costs will be minimal, if any. And we had some debunking of certain fallacies about ROE, tax codes that are, are, don't make any sense, debt and equity should be at least on an equal footing, why are we encouraging debt? Uh, and then we also said bankers warned that it would harm credit and growth, these are misplaced, and we went through debt overhang and risk weights and, and that not all credit is good and all of those. And then we said, in fact, summarized lending decisions would be improved by higher and more appropriate equity requirement. And we talked about transitions. Retained earnings is the first in pecking order. Uh, why not retain earnings? That doesn't, that, how, how would that harm lending if you retain your earning or issue more equity? Temporarily restricting dividends is the obvious place to start. And we concluded by saying, ensuring that they are finding with significantly more equity. This whole thing was about 530 words. We had to cut the words over the weekend. And Steve was there. And this was the list of signatories. And what I want to say is Steve didn't just put his name on it. Steve was involved in writing it. Uh, and, and then uh, a few months later, uh, I published an op-ed. And there was some other stupid op-ed saying banks would you know, should pay dividends. And, um, 16 of us wrote another one, only recapitalized banks should pay dividends, and here is about corporate finance. A dollar paid out to shareholders, it's about shareholder credit conflict, is a dollar not available to creditors in financial distress. Debt covenants typically restrict dividend payments when leverage is high, and they don't work as well in banking because the creditors are passive. Less concern, but taxpayers should worry about, about it. And the banks, when they are much better capitalized, can pay. And once again, we signed. There was yet another letter later that year. So this is 2010, 2011. And, uh, and this led to a lot of conversations about what's going on and why are we hearing so much nonsense uh, in, in this space. Uh, and there were, you know, it was even worse nonsense. People not understanding what the words mean, which side of the balance sheets we're talking about, what the word capital means, hold, set aside, all this other stuff. And so I set out to write a textbook for the public. This is teaching corporate finance with no symbols. Steve was very involved in this project. Uh, if it wasn't for Steve, I'm not sure I would have felt comfortable enough doing it. I needed his blessing, so, uh, so he did give it to me. And not only did he give it to me, but he spent a lot of time on this stuff. He read very early versions of the book in which we tried to approach uh, a general audience, journalists, staffer in Congress, politicians, and explain corporate finance to them. Here, he said, couldn't explain to treasurers, uh, I heard uh, from people who know about banking, oh, they don't understand, that kind of thing. Uh, and so we had in the book, uh, we started with the mortgage, because that's the only way you can teach about debt and equity to a layperson to begin with, and then take them along to corporations and what's a business line and all of that. And we started with the mortgage, Kate wants to buy a house. Now, originally it was Jane. Steve uh, is responsible for changing the name to Kate. He said that, uh, that uh, Jane is too high, too elementary school-like, and you know, uh, it's too babying. And he, he, originally, he didn't understand why we had to do it so slowly. And, you know, and I had readers who had no background, who had English PhDs or something, and had to stop and think what we were saying. So he, he was more brilliant than most people around him. And so, but he did understand that people don't understand it, that this is hard stuff. So anyway, so he helps. And then we went from K to corporations to all of that. And then we went to, to Modigliani and Miller and what's the required. And this was the hardest thing. How can you teach this stuff to a lay audience? So it's certainly the hardest thing I ever did. But Steve was right there. And we even went to Mert Miller's famous piece, whether it applies to banks, yes and no, and yes and no. Yes, because some of the logic applies to everybody, no, because the frictions matter. So I want to uh, talk about confusion and politics, which is certainly what we encountered, and Steve's presidential address. So here's one question. Is lobbying the same as marketing? You're lobbying. You're trying to uh, get somebody to buy your ideas, your proposal, the policies that you're selling them. Okay? You are explaining to them what you think. Is that the same? Marketing, lobbying, are they benign? Are they always benign? Are you just explaining things, giving information, all the ads you see, all the promises the advertisers make, marketing, lobbying. Are they, do they alleviate information asymmetry and moral hazard, or maybe they exacerbate them because they create more confusion? Maybe they create more inefficiencies, lobbying? You have to ask the question. 
you know, everybody should argue to a policymaker, but what if they get confused from all of that? What if they want to get confused? We have some theories about that. So I want to mention that Steve was very involved behind the scenes and acknowledged for these contributions, these papers that uh, I wrote with uh, three co-authors, two of them are in the room, uh, and Paul Fleider, also Steve's student from about the same time, and we bonded uh, back at Yale when he was my TA in, in micro, uh, and we've written many papers since. Uh, Paul wrote two pieces. One is in tongue-in-cheek, uh, highly recommended for teaching, uh, a funny parable about Modigliani and Miller. The other is more methodological. Steve was involved. Paul can tell you more about this, but there were many, many conversations about that. So when he cited and acknowledged it's, he really was there. And I want to tell you about one contribution where you wouldn't see his name, but he was very involved. In the year 2010, 2011, before starting to write the book, I wrote numerous op-eds, and one of them, uh, and letters to editor, mostly letters, because they were accepted more easily, uh, was a, a, a sort of op-ed that was in Reuters, Thomson, and then was in Huffington Post, which I dared to write an open letter to J.P. Morgan Chase Board. Uh, it, it was kind of a crazy idea, but it was responding to Jamie Dimon's letter to shareholders of uh, April 2011. He writes uh, these letters and he boasts about his company and then he makes pronouncements and of course, you know, he, he runs the show so everybody listens to what he says. Well, he said some things there that were highly disturbing and I thought, okay, I'll take him on. How will I take him on? With whom? With the board. And I had sections there about, you know, his flawed claims and what's going on and what's the big picture and what's the impact for policy. And in there was, a, at the end, the bottom line for J.P. Morgan Chase. And that is Steve, because I was brainstorming with Steve. I'm like, what can I say? Well, when would they listen? They wouldn't listen. Of course they wouldn't listen. Yeah, they didn't even listen anyway. But Steve was saying, you know, write something that, that would be from their own fiduciary, for they should care about, and all of that. And we're brainstorming this. I have vision visual memories of, of, of being on the phone with him, literally like, while I'm doing something else and brainstorming this thing. And so the way I ended it uh, and the way I framed it was a lot the way Steve was. Now, of course, you know, nobody read it. They didn't read it. I mean, I did send it to somebody in J.P. Morgan Chase, and I'm not going to mention here what happened as a result of that. Uh, it's for later after you give me some wine. Um, so Steve's greatness beyond uh, resume is uh, is a subject for hours and hours uh, of discussion. So before I start getting too emotional here, uh, more on why. I tried to choose my words here, otherwise the, all these would be filled. Okay, so I just decided to constrain myself to one word per circle. Okay, he was a super positive guy, happy guy, okay? That was so clear in, in everything that I said so far, but I'm going to end with something like that. In other words, I'm going to end with a little clip that would show you all these qualities. Okay, he was very, very positive. He was very, very generous. He was very, very wise. Okay, he could see things. I could talk to him about everything. Okay, he was very generous. Okay, and he was very humble. Okay, he knew what he knew. He, he, he knew he was smart, okay, but he knew what he didn't know also, okay? He would not over, over claim. He would sort of engage with you no matter what. If he disagrees, he also, uh, he was humble, okay? So now I need the video again. Okay, so this is the last time I saw him. Uh, so Steve came to a conference a year ago for uh, David Kreft at Stanford, and he came for three days, and we got to spend three evenings with him. Uh, and I'm going to focus on him here because it's not about me. This is, uh, I did not cross my mind for one split second. It was going to be the last time I saw him. Uh, and there he was. You see the smile, okay? Uh, and I had some email exchanges and some phone with him since then, but that's the last time I saw him. I want to end with, uh, wait, I, I meant to go forward. I, I have a video right now. Wait, I need the sound. Can you start? Go back. Yeah, it's here. Now? No. What? The sound is up? Here's, people say, what's your, what's your secret? I don't know if I have a secret, but here's what I think is important. A key is not to tell students that what they're doing 
isn't interesting. That's not the same as saying that what they're doing is interesting. In fact, that's just as wrong. But you just never say to them that what they're doing isn't interesting. And the reason you don't isn't just to be kind. It's because, in fact, you actually don't know. You might think you know, but you actually don't know. And second, it's a terrible thing to say. As a researcher, you're searching for some reference point and trying to find your own sense of taste. And that should be encouraged, and it should never be discouraged. Never discourage creativity, because it drives people into pedestrian activities. That was Steve's advice, OK? You could take anything he write and then follow his advice. Question him. See what he said was right and wrong. That's what he wanted to do. That's what he did. Thank you. Uh, Anad, Doug, thank you very much for wonderful uh, presentations. And uh, now we break for lunch to continue the discussion in a less formal setting, and then we'll reconvene uh, in an hour and 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you.